Well, and good day, Pastor Dave here from Evangel Pentecostal Church. Welcome to our weekly study through John's Gospel. This is week number 41. And we're going to be looking through verses 11 to 21 in John chapter 10. So let's pray together. Lord, I, I ask you to just come upon every believer that is studying your word today. Lord, I pray that just blessing, Lord, as we read your word. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Give us all we need, Father, to be encouraged and stirred from your word today. Amen. Amen. So we finished off verse 10 last week, uh, which was a comparison of the thief who comes to kill and to destroy. And of course, the comparison was the good shepherd, Jesus, who comes for just the opposite purpose, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So there was the comparison that the thief who comes to kill and the one who comes to give life and give it more abundantly. And so we're going to jump into verse 11 this week. And again, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Other translations will say the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. So one says lays down, the other says gives. Both are correct. Just the difference, uh, difference in translation. Friends, that's the heart of the gospel. The good shepherd who lays down, who gives his life for the sheep. That is the heart of the gospel. That is the gospel message. It is the very purpose for which Jesus came and which Jesus accomplished for you and for me on the cross of Calvary. Jesus, upon that cross, took the very wrath of God that should have fallen on, on us, but came upon Jesus. The very wrath we deserve was laid upon Jesus. You know, we might have many prayer requests to Jesus. We might come to him for a specific need. But let us remember that the essence of the gospel is not what he can do for you, but rather what has already been done for you. And that work has been accomplished. He is the good shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep. There's a prophecy given by the prophet Isaiah 600 years before Jesus came. And it's, and it's recorded in, in chapter 40, verse 11 of the prophet Isaiah. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. That's a prophecy of the Messiah. And friends, we know that Jesus fulfilled this, this beautiful picture, a wonderful picture of, of the shepherd so acquainted with all our ways that Jesus knows all of our problems and all of our concerns. He didn't just step down from heaven as God, but he became fully man as well. And knows our problems, knows our aches, knows our pains, the good shepherd. Verses 12 and 13, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now in this verse, we see this comparison of this hired hand with the good shepherd. Other translations use the word hireling. Both are correct. In most situations, we know, of course, the sheep is only going to have one shepherd. But there are certain conditions, perhaps sickness or something else happened, that the shepherd could not take care of the sheep. In that situation, the shepherd would have to hire a temporary shepherd. And this, of course, was the hired hand or the hireling. And this temporary shepherd was there to what? He was there to earn money. That was his focus. That was why he was hired. He was not hired to put his life in danger. He was there to take care of the sheep. And the hireling was to take care of the sheep. But if push came to shove, he was, he was more about his own safety than the safety of the sheep. So if a sheep needed to be sacrificed, bye-bye sheep. And so in this scripture, it's the wolf, right? The wolf comes along and this hireling is hired 
shepherd is not about to come between the wolf and the sheep. When danger comes, the hired shepherd is long gone because he simply does not care about the sheep, why he is there to make some dollars, a few bucks, and that's it. He's not there to lay down his life. So what is Jesus talking about when he talks about the hired hand or these hirelings? Who could they be? Well, I'm thinking, obviously, at the time, Jesus is, is really stirring up the Pharisees, and, and they're listening. It's the Pharisees that are listening. And no doubt within the context of what Jesus is saying, he's, he's poking, as it were, uh, the Pharisees. But in our world today, uh, we don't have any official Pharisees. So who would it be? Well, it's, it's those people that are, that are in ministry. They have a ministry position, but they're really only serving their own needs. They might think they're serving the Lord, but by their actions, that they really show that they're really there only for their own interest. They want the recognition. They want the praise from their positions. And so if it comes down to a sacrifice, they're long gone because they're just a hired hand. So if we're looking at, at who these people are, they're really the Pharisee type people, the, the Pharisaical people. And it's those people that are going to be uh, fulfilling this role of a hireling. So the main context, though, of this scripture is that Jesus loves and cares for the sheep so much that Jesus will come between the wolf and the sheep. Jesus is the one who will place himself in harm's way, even to the point of giving his life. And in a sheep fold in a, in a flock, there might be hundreds of sheep. But as long as Jesus is caring for the sheep, the wolf isn't going to get even one. It doesn't matter. As long as Jesus is the good shepherd, the wolf is going to go hungry. That is for sure. Verse 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. These are verses of intimacy. I know my own, and my own know me. Do you remember back in verse 4, we read that the uh, sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Remember when all the sheep were mixed up in the sheepfold, and the shepherd comes and calls the sheep, and the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, and they follow him. But here we read that this knowing is a mutual knowing. He knows us, and we know him. And in the next verse, we're given this model for this intimacy. And the model is, of course, the love between the father and the son. So just as the shepherd know the sheep, it's similar to the love that the father has for the son. And Jesus adds this information to this parable to really help as understand the depth of his amazing love. Just as the father loves the son, so the, the shepherd loves the sheep. Wow. Think about that for a moment because it really is absolutely amazing. Jesus is comparing the love he has for the sheep with, with the very love he has for the father. And when your love is that great, you are willing to lay down your life for each other. Ephesians 5.24 tells us that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is the love that Christ has for the church, the shepherd, for the sheep. In verse 16, it says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Well, there's one sheepfold. This is a one sheepfold, one shepherd scripture. Unity, in the sense it's talking about here, isn't really our responsibility to make happen as much as it really is an exist. It's, it's an existing reality. It isn't something we're going to make happen. It's an existing reality. There's one shepherd, one sheepfold, and that's it. 
that speaks of unity. So there's a oneness there. But here then, Jesus talks about other sheep. So who possibly could Jesus be referring to as these other sheep? If there's only one shepherd and only one sheepfold, then who are the other sheep that Jesus is talking about here? He said there's other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So they will be one flock and one shepherd. So these other sheep, and I'm quite sure that what Jesus is talking about is the sheep that are outside of the parameters of Judaism. And this, of course, in the context of what Jesus is talking about, those who have never heard his name. And no doubt those outside of the parameters of Judaism are, of course, the Gentiles. And so this is exactly what Jesus is talking about, the Gentiles. You see, the early church, especially back in the days of Jesus, and shortly after, uh, the church was predominantly solely Jews, Jewish, but persecution hit the church. It wasn't too far in, into Acts that we see persecution came. Paul was, or Saul was persecuting the church, and the church began to scatter. The church went out, they left Jerusalem, they went out into all of Judea and, and to Samaria and to many parts of the world. They scattered in all directions. And of course, as they went, they took the message of Jesus with them. And Gentiles heard, and Gentiles believed, and Gentiles became part of the church. And so they became part of the sheepfold. Remember, there's only one sheepfold and only one shepherd. And so the Gentiles then became part of the sheepfold. So what is really happening here is this is what Jesus is talking about, this new thing that is coming, which, of course, is the church. And uh, this thing called the church, is it's, it's going to be far greater than Judea. It's going to be much bigger than Samaria. It's going to go to the uttermost part of the world, the entire planet. Regardless of Jew or Gentile, slave or free, well, let's, so let's read that scripture in Galatians 3. 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We get that? There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. It doesn't matter. One in Christ Jesus. There's only one sheepfold. There's only one shepherd. And when we get to 17, we will see the immense love now that Jesus has for this whole world, the, the whole sheepfold. But that's later. But friends, read chapter 17. And you'll see it, what Jesus says. Now in verse 17 and 18, it says, For this reason... The Father loves me because I lay, by, I lay my life down that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus now gives us a much deeper understanding of the Father's love for him. Understand that Jesus is not having his life taken from him. Now, when I say that, you're thinking, well, I thought Jesus was crucified on the cross and he was, he was killed. Well, friends, the cross was not some accident of fate. This was the plan of God. Jesus would lay his life down. Jesus would surrender to the Father's will. This is absolutely contrary to anybody who thinks that, that, uh, that Jesus you know, was killed uh, to earn the Father's love. Uh, you know, through a sacrifice. That is not what happened, uh, not even close. Jesus gave his life. He willingly gave up his life. He gave it voluntarily. And he did this as an expression of the love the Son has for the Father. Yes, Jesus struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane to admit and say, not my will be done, but your will be done. That was the human side of Jesus. But in the end, the very end, 
Jesus laid it all down and gave it to the Father. Please know that Jesus did not die because of the conspiracy of the Pharisees and what the Romans did. Jesus was not a martyr whose life and ministry ended suddenly and tragically. No. Acts chapter 2, Peter said this, this man, meaning Jesus, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. The plan of salvation. The plan of salvation was never a fixed solution. This wasn't something the Father did as the ultimate rescue operation. Well, not at all. There is no power in the universe that could separate the Father from the Son. Not the grave and certainly not a tomb with a big stone over it. Jesus has all authority to lay down his life, but also to take it up again. And because Jesus gave his life as the perfect sacrifice, because of that, our entry into the Father's love is not based upon any effort of my own. It's not based upon who I am. It isn't based upon what I have accomplished. It is based solely upon what Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary's cross. And friends, if I could be really, really blunt here, Jesus became that lamb. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb in order that we, dumb sheep, that we, that we, our, these, these dumb sheep might come to know the good shepherd. That's why Jesus died. That's why he gave his life, that we might know the good shepherd. Jesus did it all. He laid down his life and he became the very door through which we enter the sheepfold. Friends, there's only one door and Jesus is the only way. In taking up his life again, Jesus will always be the good shepherd, the one who will guide us and care for us, leading us into green pastures. As Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He will always watch over, he, he will always protect us. Because he is the good shepherd. Now verse 19 and 21 says this. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and he's insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who was oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the reaction of the crowds to what Jesus had said in verse 17 and 18 that we just read. And what we read here in these verses is there's a division. There's a separation of thinking, uh, a very, very stark division, as it were. On one side, they're saying that Jesus is demon-possessed, that, that Jesus is out of his mind, that he's, he's absolutely nuts. He's gone right off the deep end. He's off his rocker. Why should we listen to such utter nonsense? And if we're taking notes about this, we would see that this isn't the first time that, you know, Jesus has been accused of being demon-possessed. You've only got to go back to chapter 7, verse 20, and chapter 8, verse 48, and uh, 8, verse 52, uh, where Jesus is accused of being demon-possessed. But that's not the whole story, because there's others in the crowd in this in this division. There's others, others in the crowd that are thinking about what has been going on. They're thinking about what is being said. They're thinking about what they've witnessed. And these are the people that are beginning to connect the dots. They're not fully there, but they're beginning to connect dots. And they're seeing that things make sense. They're thinking, well... If this man, Jesus, healed this, this blind man, this man who was blind since birth, if he has done such a great miracle, well, that can't be done by demons. This great miracle of healing this man born blind can only come from God. So this side of the, of the crowd wasn't fully professing faith in the Messiah at this point. But they, uh, their minds were open to the very possibility that Jesus could 
be the promised Messiah. And so this side of the crowd is saying, let's not write him off, but let's listen and see if what he says is the truth. And so this side of the crowd was watching. They weren't 100% convinced, but they were beginning to see and some things were beginning to connect the dots. In our world today, those people are the people that we call the seekers. They are, they're, they're looking, they're thinking, they're going deeper, they're doing some research. But friends, we also know there are so many in our world today that so quickly write off Jesus. They don't even give the time to do some research. Friends, eternity is a long time. You know, if you're going on a on a holiday somewhere, you're going to do some research into that place. You're going to see the the you're going to look for points of interest or you know where you might stay, where where you might eat. What I'm saying is you're going to do some research when you go on a holiday. Well, friends, eternity will come for each of us. Should we not be doing some research as to where we're going? And the Bible has those answers. Spend some effort. Spend some research. Because eternity is a long time. And friends, you don't want to get it wrong. But many just throw the message of Jesus away, saying, that's all nonsense. My heart is people would take the time and do some homework. Be the other part of the crowd that says, hmm, maybe, maybe, just maybe. And you get on that road. And once you begin to, to, to dig in and to do some research, the only conclusion you will come to is Jesus is exactly who he says he is he is the son of god the son of the living god who laid his life down he is the good shepherd as we read here he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep let's pray together lord i pray these words would just encourage our hearts lord i pray these words would stir us today and know jesus that you are the good shepherd Who's laid who's who has laid down his life for the sheep and lord if there's anyone listening if there's anyone that has not lord accepted you as savior and as lord i pray god that they would god they wouldn't take my words for it but lord they would read lord again these these scriptures they would seek you they would ask you holy spirit i pray you would come upon them he would give them understanding and wisdom. And Lord, they would seek you while it, there is still time. So Lord, I pray you would bless and encourage each person. Lord, be with us this day. Guide us and direct us. And we thank you for your truths. Fill your people, Lord. Encourage their hearts in Jesus' name. And Lord, well, I'll see you next week. And we'll continue in week number 42. We'll continue in John chapter 10. Until then, have a great week serving the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless. Bye-bye for now.